she's always been there. She's always right there, right by my side, all the time. I like you. <laughs> In the last half a century of church history, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland are two of the most influential global Christian leaders. Now, they're nearing six decades of ministry together. But we have been side by side. Yeah, we have. For over 60 years. Yes, that's we have. right. And we do not have strife. No. Now, that's some key to a happy life if you're married. Get along, don't have strife. And it was her unconditional love that brought me to that place where my heart was soft to Jesus. And then there were also the prayers of his mother, Vinetta. Well, I was an only child, and for reasons that my mother couldn't have more children. And she, she was so sweet, just a loving, loving woman. But she prayed for her little boy. I was her project. She prayed for me night and day. I asked my dad one time, I would leave the house and I'd hear her pray. I'd come back, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning, she's still in there praying. Particularly after she got baptized and the Holy Ghost praying in tongues, I mean, she prayed all the time. Raised in a devout Christian home, Copeland attended his parents' Baptist church. My dad, listen, his word was his bond. He had two accounts at the bank. One was his account, one was his tithe account. He wouldn't even let God's money get in his account. And they tithed all the way through the Great Depression. And mother would say, I would watch him just as far as I could see him. He was out of a job, but I knew he'd have one when he got back. Kenneth was a musically talented young man. He sang and later crooned lead with popular local groups. And I just felt like I was maybe called to do something. I just got under conviction and cried and wept and came home and told my mother, I think maybe I'm supposed to be a, a music director or something in the church. And, and I went to ask some of the church people about it. And they said, no, we don't want a tramp like you representing uh, any part of our church. Well, it, it, it hurt me and made me mad. I just, I was furious. And I left there, and that night, I went to a nightclub there in Fort Worth called The Cellar. I said, well, those Christians didn't want me, and these people do, and I left. I didn't want anything to do with them. It turned me bitter. I was mad at the world. Depression was a way of life. I didn't sleep much. When I was in the high school, sometimes just get up in the middle of the night and go bowl around the two trying to go to sleep because I had all that anger and depression in me, just bitter at the world. The entertainment world offered plenty of distraction from his inner angst. He headlined at clubs around the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area, and he recorded a top 40 hit, Pledge of Love. Even with success within his grasp, he couldn't clutch the brass ring. Considered myself a total failure at everything. And uh, that's the condition I was in when, when I received my draft notice. And I was just out there doing what everybody else did. And I got a call. It was a disc jockey at KELP El Paso. He wanted to talk to me. He said, could you come to the station and get an interview? I said, what on earth for? You don't know? No, I don't know what. Your song is on the charts. I love you so, I can't let you go. My song, Pledge of Love, is on the chart. Yeah, it's on the charts now. Johnny Mathis and you were bumping up and down for third and fourth place on Billboard. And I'm in the United States Army. <laughs> Out of the Army, he landed in Hollywood. After a while, he soured on the entertainment world. 
and he headed back to Texas. I was paid a very low amount for the record. They said, well, this is a fine little domestic song, and so there will be no, you know, no overseas royalties or anything. One of my, my very, very best friends in high school, he went into the CBs right after high school. He came back. He said, Kenneth, your song, Pledge of Love, it's fabulous. fabulous. I said, Jimmy, where'd you hear it? He said, in Tokyo, brother. I learned many years later that it was a million seller. But thank God I didn't know it. It kept me out of that business. I had no business in that business. I was called to preach, and that's where I belong. For I can't live without your love. Over the years, he's reflected on that time in his life. As an elder Christian statesman, he knows his mother's prayers forged his destiny to serve the Lord. However, at the time, he says he knew he lacked a vision for his life. At home in Texas, he managed aircraft sales for a company while furthering his aviation license. It wasn't until a business acquaintance introduced Copeland to his daughter that his life took on a sense of something miraculous. October the 8th. 1961, Little Rock, Arkansas, about 10 o'clock in the morning. That elevator opened and Gloria Jean Niece, Wallace and Mary were in that elevator. And uh, I said, Gloria, would you like to go out on the deck and just look at the city of Little Rock? She said, yes. And so we walked out there and I come out here and she walked up and she was just standing there and she patted me on the back. It was like I'd known her all of my life. I fell in love with her. I mean, so deeply. And like some people say, I mean, it went, it went completely to my toes. I, I just, I knew right then I couldn't live without her. Right at that minute, the moment that happened, I could tell all the bitterness just running out of me. I just started melting. And I could tell it. On their first date at the Rocket Room, they shared a dance. Well, 40 miles back to Blevins. So we walked up on her dad's porch. I said, Gloria, will you marry me? She said, OK, and just walked in the house. I just stood there, stunned. What now? <laughs> Six months later, they married on April 13th, 1962. They lived in an apartment with just a rollaway bed and a homemade coffee table. Their coffee percolator doubled as a cooker. And she, oh, and she was so lovely to me all the time so sweet to me, cared for me, watched after me. And it just, it was just the most marvelous thing that ever happened to me in my whole life. And today she's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. When his mother sent him a Bible as a birthday present, Gloria was the one who received the intended gift. And she signed it inside, Kenneth Precious. And the scripture there, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. She just put the scripture reference. So Gloria took that scripture reference and found it and read it. She said, well, I certainly do need things. Lord, take my life and do something with it. She had never heard the term born again. I had, because I came out of the Baptist church, but she didn't. That's when she would see Jesus. I didn't know anything about that. She didn't say anything to me about it. Two weeks later, Copeland stepped out of the back room on the way to look for a furnished apartment with Gloria. Suddenly, 
the same to me as the room filled up with the glory of God. Uh, then I just stopped and I heard it on the inside of me. Kenneth, if you, if you don't get right with me, you're going to a devil's hell, son. I said, I know it, I know it. But what do I do now? So I just said, Jesus, come into my heart. <laughs> the only way I know to describe it, if you've been raised in a boiler room, suddenly it went quiet. It'd be the loudest noise you ever heard. All of that bitterness and that, that stuff, just the rest of it just went away. I was so much in love with Gloria. And, but, but that just finished it off. Well, then I said, Gloria, because we hadn't talked about this. I said, what if I, uh, uh, what, what, you know, what if I were to give my testimony or, or, or talk for God or something? She said, hallelujah, and threw up both hands. I said, what are you talking about? She told me what happened to her. And we just hugged one another. And all we wanted to do is go to church. If we saw a church steeple, we wanted to go see what they were doing. We'd never been to church. We wanted to see what everybody was doing. We were so church hungry. That's all we wanted to do. And then I started talking to everybody I flew with about Jesus. Remarkably, Copeland's commercially rated pilot's license was about to land him alongside Oral Roberts, one of the most well-known preachers in the world. Healing, salvations, and the renewed power to witness all flowed from Robert's ministry. Copeland's parents financially supported Robert's multifaceted ministry and the newly developed Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They encouraged their son to study theology at ORU and together they visited there. And I thought, this is just, this is the Oral Roberts. <laughs> and he's laying hands on people and I get to see it. While in a meeting, God spoke to Copeland through a vision about his future. The people disappeared. He didn't. But the people disappeared. I could see a, a, a little blue outline, which was their physical bodies. But I could see the spirit man. And they were so emaciated and so sick looking. And their heads looked large and because of religious teaching. And I looked at that and I began to weep uncontrollably. I just wept and wept and cried and cried and cried. I left to go back across there. I, I couldn't control it. And I tried to tell Glory about it. I couldn't even talk. Later, the, the word of the Lord came to me and he said, I've called you to do something about this. But that came later. After Copeland was accepted to ORU School of Theology, he, Gloria, and their two small children moved to Tulsa. While in university, he needed to support his family, so we met with the dean to ask about work-study opportunities. Copeland shared that he was a licensed pilot and was immediately ushered into Oral Roberts' office. Two weeks earlier, Roberts had received a prophetic word of knowledge to hire a student with a commercially rated pilot's license. There in front of Robert stood Copeland with the proper FAA credentials. He was hired on the spot. He soon became a trusted member of Oral Roberts' ministry team. Copeland experienced firsthand God's miraculous power to save the lost, pray for the sick, and see them recover. It started a relationship that lasted. He became my spiritual father. And I, I did my best to be a son to him. Anything he wanted, any time, I didn't care what it was. Copeland served on the ministry prayer team when Robert's meetings overflowed with sick and suffering people. He said, Kenneth, we, can, we can't get all these people prayed for. I'm going to set you up a prayer line this afternoon. I said, okay, I'm glad to do it. Well, my mother and dad were there. And there was 500 people lined up in that line. So mother came around there and the, put her hands in my back. And the first one, large eggplant looking thing that came down out of her hairline here. And she came up there like this. 
when I saw that, just compassion and anger came all over me. I said, in the name of Jesus. And when I said it, the thing disappeared. My mother said, where'd that thing go? I said, I don't know. It was gone. At the same time, Copeland discovered Kenneth Hagin's teaching on the power and the authority of Jesus' name when praying for the sick. So the name of Jesus was, now here was the combination of the two ministries. I was learning faith from Brother Hagin and, and learning miracles from Brother Roberts, both at the same time and had, had become friends, both of them. So I said, that's my point of contact. I walked up to her, this woman, her nurse held her up here like this, and I said, in the name of G, and that's as far as I got. I'll tell you, and I thought the lion of the tribe of Judah has roared. I mean, all the hair on my body stood up. You foul, unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whose I am and whom I serve, take your hands off of God's property now. She spit that malignant tumor out of her mouth and the thing was still working like this. I thought, it had the tentacles on it. I thought, that thing looks just like a jellyfish. I saw things like that. In 1968, he founded Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Later, with a gift of $5,000, he bought a single-engine Cessna and flew himself wherever there was an opportunity to preach the name of Jesus. So I started in over there where I learned it from Kenneth Hagin, and it's the scripture that got him off of the bed of affliction. Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto that mountain, to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Faith is released in the mouth. That all started with the mandate God gave him in 1968, which was to get the gospel to everyone on the globe by any available means, including TV. Millions of people worldwide tuned into Kenneth Copeland's weekly Sunday broadcast, The Believer's Voice of Victory. On January 30th, 1989, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland launched their daily TV ministry program. And we were not looking for anything else to do. No, we like were not. daily. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, <laughs> Saturday, Sunday. And we came. We had to do it, though. We had to do it. And I went in to start the daily, the first daily. We were doing and I was five a day, so five broadcasts a day. That, but this was the very first one. I was so exhausted. I just got up and said, I quit. Well, Gloria was in the con control room back there. And that's when she said, well, I'll do it. So she walked in there and sat down and did a daily broadcast. And she did five daily broadcasts. Later, in prayer, exhausted and ashamed, Copeland asked the Lord to forgive him for his outburst. He also went and asked the same of his team. After days of much needed rest, he went back on the set. He and Gloria taught from the Bible to the audience at home. For almost six decades, millions of Christians have been strengthened through the Copeland's ministry. This is Dale Jacobson, Chief from Lynchburg, Virginia. Four years ago, she was uh, diagnosed with ovarian cancer, went through chemotherapy. And as a result of that, she got neuropathy in her feet. And she said this morning, her feet are tingling. She can feel oh, again. Glory to God. Come on, Gail, walk across there. I want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> They've used every venue and technology available to preach the gospel and demonstrate the power of the name of Jesus through healing. They're more in love with God and each other than ever. Here's this, stay in love. Don't argue with one another. Walk in love because faith works by love. And of course, if faith works by love, then the devil's gonna do his best to keep you in strife. 
and then he can keep control of the situation. You just can't, you can't win that way. You just have to walk in love. And besides that, that's the only way it's worth living. You know, who wants to live in strife? Not me. Help one another. Don't, don't run one another down when your friends are around. Don't make fun of one another. Don't make jokes about one another. Just love one another. Love uh, words. Love, just love words all the time. You know, and Gloria, I was thinking earlier this morning, we learned what true prosperity is. Yeah, And that's right. when you say prosperity, people usually think of finances. <laughs> but no, spiritual prosperity is first. Being born again is the most important thing that can happen to any human being alive. You will be involved in the greatest spiritual awakening that this nation has ever seen.